The Cleveland Cavaliers are in an interesting position. A squad that's used to bright lights and long seasons suddenly has to find an identity in their new LeBronless era. Kevin will get more love and was paid big bucks this offseason by a franchise hoping he can morph from Robin into Batman. The Cavs also add a burst of speed and fresh blood as the young bull Colin Sexton will lace them up in his rookie season in the land. Coach Lou has managed one of the most high profile coaching positions in the league the past few years, but perhaps this season will present his best coaching job yet. All this and more as we preview the Cavs coming up next. Welcome in, everybody. The NBA season is finally nearly here. We're previewing the Cavs today. I'm Roz Goldenwede, and I have the pleasure of being here with NBA greats, Coach Mike Fratello, Derek Harper. Hey, Roz. Hey. And guys, let's just jump right into it. So can Kevin Love go from Robin to Batman Love? I mean, what's a realistic expectation as far as his leadership and productivity? I want to know if Kevin Love's picture is going to be on that building in Cleveland. <laughs> yeah, we did the LeBron occupied it for the last four years. They, they, took the it they took it Probably. down. Maybe somebody's got to go up. up. Yep. Yeah, you got to put something up there. I, it's an interesting question, though, that, that Raj presents. You know, Kevin, 17 and 9 last year uh, on the offensive end. I think you got to go. You have to go back to Minnesota days, where he was Batman, and he uh, not able to quite get over the hump. He can score the basketball. Always going to be a great rebounder. Can really shoot the three and stretch the floor. Things of that nature. But I, when when you look up, think about what you gave up in LeBron James, from a defensive standpoint, scoring, assists, rebounding, all of those different things. I don't think Kev Kevin Love can be that. But I think he can be adequate enough to, uh, to lead this team in a lot of different ways. This is a different Kevin Love. The fact that the franchise stepped up and gave him the new contract, mm -hmm. I think told Kevin, we love you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we all know we've lost a very significant piece Absolutely. in LeBron James. But somebody has to take that leadership role, and they had enough confidence and faith in Kevin Love to give him the contract, give him the deal, yes. which now lets him kind of take over that group and try and lead them on. Without LeBron James, though, especially on the offensive end, all of the spacing changes, all of the ways shots are formed and created for pl other players changes. And for Kevin Love, where does that happen? What is the points of emphasis as his offense needs to evolve for this season? I know in training camp right now they've emphasized one ball movement. The Absolutely. word stick doesn't come up. <laughs> they want that ball in and out of your hands as quickly as possible. They also emphasize the fact that Kevin Love has to get more touches this mm -hmm. year. They love his ability to make his teammates better by passing the basketball. So by running cuts, screening, moving without the basketball, he will find you. He's an unselfish yeah. player, and he has the skills to do it. So expect him elbow a lot, low post a lot. Well, and those are the areas that he worked when he was in Minnesota, the high post, the left block in particular. I think he's really, really comfortable. What, 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 what are the guys around him? What are they going to be able to do with Kevin Love? Because obviously this is going to take a collective effort, if you would, when you start talking about the Cavs this year. I'm just curious to his supporting cast and how they're going to help him be successful as a player. And help each other be successful, yeah. right? Because not only was LeBron about putting up points, but he was about making other players better. Mm -hmm. You know, I imagine to see uh, by committee assists going up, uh -huh. everybody, as you said, moving the ball. And one young guy that could help out with that, perhaps the number eight draft pick and Colin Sexton. What do you expect for this guy? I know he's going to bring a lot of speed. Right. I like him. Watched him in Alabama. Avery Johnson is a good friend of mine. I've mm -hmm. talked to him a little bit about uh, Saxon. He's young. And when you look at a young player in this league, one of the things that they have to learn immediately is not to pound the basketball. Coach just talked yeah. about the ball movement, things of that nature. The other thing I think, the, the, the hole in his game is being a consistent outside shooter, a guy that consistently knocked down the outside shot, knocked down the three-point shots. Because this league scouts mm. in, in, a, in a very unique way. They're going to know your strengths and your weaknesses coming into this season. So I don't think guys are going to be up on him. They're going to play off of him and force him to be a threat shooting the basketball. Coach, with, with coaching perspective, um, especially for a point guard being young, what is the learning curve for a young, especially rookie, point guard in the NBA? Well, he's certainly going to learn from a head coach who has been there and done it himself mm -hmm. in many di different situations. But... As Derek said, 
in the summer league, when you get a pick, number eight pick in the draft, you give them the ball and you say, show us what you can do. Right. Mm -hmm. There's not a whole lot of pulling back and mm -hmm. pulling the reins in. Well, he averaged almost 20 points per game, over three and a half assists, shot just under 43 percent. But in training camp, interestingly, they've played him at both spots, both the point and then moved him over to the two guard position. He has strength, size, and aggressiveness. Will his shot come along? I think it'll get better as they it go will. along. But something that's happened over and over again in practice is make somebody else better on right. your team. Mm -hmm. Make somebody else better by moving the ball. And, and, and as a point guard, you, you can't play at one speed. And I, I think a lot of young players in this league, they don't understand that there's a time to go, there's a time to slow. And the sooner, the quicker he learns those kind of things, I think it'll put him in command and a little bit more under control young in his career. I can totally speak to that. A lot of times when you're young, you're just trying to figure out yeah, where you, you got to go, go, go and go, where go, to go, be, go. Yeah. let alone try to lead others or know how to change speeds and have that much control over your body. But the Cavs will need him to contribute or at least grow relatively soon. So on media day, T Teron Liu discussed his outlook on the Cavs after the departure of the King. We know how important LeBron is, um, you know, to this franchise of winning the championship in 2016, um, winning the Eastern Conference four years in a row, and um, we're very thankful for that. Um, I think now, you know, we have new challenges, a new chapter as far as, um, you know, uh, young guys, old guys mixing um, to be a good team, to, good, to putting a good product on the floor, um, to making the playoffs. So um, I don't see this as a rebuild or anything different. I think we got a young mix of young guys and older guys that can help each other, and I'm very excited for it. Coach Lou says it's not a rebuild. Do you believe him? <laughs> I do. Okay. Because otherwise we would have seen them move some players in the offseason. Mm -hmm. They've held on. I think the belief is we're much better off being a playoff team this year than trying to sell the, the fact that we're going to start over again for you. And they get the opportunity to do that without so much scrutiny and spotlight uh -huh. on them and expectation. So what are the pros and the cons of the coaching situation that Coach Lou is in? Well, I think Ty, for the first time in his career, it's not easy coaching a superstar, the best player in the, in the NBA for the last couple of years. He'll get to coach now. Mm -hmm. You know, with LeBron gone, he, he can really get after guys, put guys in positions to be successful and yeah, these guys know who Tehran is, and they they have enough chemistry there still that they can be respectable. It's going to be an opportunity for him to coach a bunch of role players, mm -hmm. not trying to slight anybody, mm -hmm. yeah. along with one all-star in Kevin Love. So now, how does he change his philosophy at the offensive end? What does he do differently at the defensive end? If we go back to a year ago, Cleveland was very good at the offensive end of the floor. They ranked in the top five categories in all the important areas. They were horrendous at the defense. defense. We gave up 110, just yeah. like they scored. And, and, and they got better at the end after the third season for them. And that's the first group, the second group they brought in, and then right at the last minute, that right. last group that finished yeah. up, that they got a little bit better defensively then. Well, how does Coach now try to identify the, the adjustments he has to make and the new players stepping into new roles, like the new vocal leaders, the new practice guys? who he goes to end a game situations last two minutes. I mean, it's not only going to be Kevin Love. No, this is something he'll find out as they go along. We don't play as many exhibition games now as, they, exactly as right. they used to play. But that's where practice, and even that's shortened a little bit, the number of practices. Now, that's where it becomes so important to have an idea of where we're going with the ball, to emphasize to everyone what we're trying to get done. Mm -hmm. This is the deepest Cavaliers team that they've had in a while. Take away the superstar, right. LeBron James. But as far as depth and guys that can play, you have eight players on this team that have played in an NBA mm -hmm. final. Been and there, and, and the it. psyche, to me, will be different this year because anytime you lose a guy of LeBron's cal caliber, guys are anxious to prove that you can do well without a guy like LeBron James. And I'm, it, I think it'll be interesting to see whether or not Kevin can do what they're expecting him to do. But more importantly, the Gerard Smiths, mm -hmm. Kristen Thompson, those guys, how they uh, take on that leadership role as well. All right, Coach. With LeBron gone, Kevin Love is going to be in an elevated role, but the types of shots and the way he gets those shots, it's going to change. It's going to adjust. So where do you expect him to be on the court this season? Well, let's not forget that always coming down the court in transition, he likes to drag to that high left spot behind mm -hmm. the three-point line yep. so that point guard can hit him quickly for the three-point look. He loves the left side of the floor. Yep. But let's go back to last season, if you don't mind, 
Would you play the superstar LeBron James first? I get to be LeBron? You're, you're the star. Oh, okay. the star you're up in that high elbow area. And this is the best I've ever been in my entire <laughs> basketball career <laughs> during this broadcast. First time for everything. <laughs> they would love to put uh, Kevin Love down in this low post area and a shooter or scorer, maybe JR, out in the corner. Or Hood. With with or hood, right. mm -hmm. with LeBron handling the basketball. And from here, when the play would come down, Kevin Love would step out. They'd run this guard or forward off, looking for a quick layup. But at that point, Love would then step in and look for the pass to get him down in the post. Now he has the ability to look over the floor or start his post move by backing down, backing down to see if he can get to his jump hook, get mm -hmm. to the foul line, or distribute the basketball. This year, it could be a little bit different looking because now this could be Kevin Love up in this area. And you got to figure out who's going to go down into that corner area, who's going to go down into the low left post area with Love being the distributor of the basketball. Hitting open people yeah. or obviously his ability to make a shot. Or he could then go into a dribble handoff series with the person coming out of the corner to try and get something going from there. So a little more flexibility. We may see him drag high, elbow area to feed, low post to score, or... Spacing is going to be extremely important, I think, in that situation. I don't think teams are going to allow Kevin Love to beat them, him being the go-to guy, the number one option. So on the weak side of the floor, you got to have shooters. Mm. And they have a bunch of shooters. Corver, obviously, one of the uh, best three-point shooters in the land. J.R. Smith can make threes. So they're going to be in good, good position offensively, I think, to make a lot of positive happen. You know, one thing I'm curious about, too, in media day or after practice, uh, Coach Lou actually said Rodney Hood could potentially be his number two scorer. So what are some situations he might be utilized in more? Is that just him working strictly with maybe Kevin Love up here? No, that little series that we ran in the beginning where Derek starts out in yeah. the corner here, remember, if that's a Rodney Hood, there's so many things you can do from this. Number one, Rodney Hood has size. Mm -hmm. If you have love down the low post, who they have to respect and honor, if he steps out and nails Hood's guy, you're looking quickly for Hood down that low post area. But Hood also has the ability to come off that screen, and he may pop. Let's go back again, Derek, just to show. He may get to this area, and depending on if his man decides to come over the top. He comes, he comes, come, he gets right to here. Fade back. His defender goes over the top. He fades right back. Love steps in. Yep. And you've got a whole different thing here because he mm -hmm. has a scorer's mentality. He's been very aggressive in training camp. He understands he has a one-year deal. <laughs> He's playing yeah. for his next contract and his future in the NBA. You know, a lot of this stuff that we're talking about, we did against Atlanta when Coach Mata was the coach and you were coaching here. And Rolando and I, did some of that same stuff. Yeah, you guys really cheated a lot <laughs> on the series, I'll tell you that. Okay. All right, fellas, let's check out the Cavs' depth chart. We talked a bit about Kevin Love already, a little about Rodney Hood, but what about the opportunity that presents itself for Tristan Thompson this season? I think when you look at their front court, there are a lot of bodies, and you have interchangeable pieces up front. You can play Fry as a backup five. You can play him as a four. You can play, obviously, Love as a five or a four. Thompson's got some help with Zizic, who is very good down the low post area. I think they like their options. So your defensive specialist is Tristan Thompson, who should get you 10, 11 rebounds mm -hmm. a game. Offensive rebounds, so important to them. But then there's a lot of other depth. Well, for Tristan, in my opinion, he knows his role. He's been around in Cleveland for a long time. Knows his role. I think he... Uh, I look at him as the energy guy for that basketball team, whether he starts or come off the bench. He seems to bring that energy to rebound, especially on the offensive glass. And, I mean, you can always use that kind of a player. It seems like everybody's got to bring the extra energy, mm -hmm. all of the intangible things. Make up the space, loss. Space out, move the ball, crash the boards if you're Tristan Thompson. Is it, is it kind of by committee mentality in a way? This team is playing with a chip on its shoulder right now. They go into training camp with everyone saying they're done, they're finished. When you say that a team is going to win only 30 games in a season, that's what many of the experts have been predicting. Mm -hmm. That's an insult to a team that has been to four straight <laughs> NBA finals. But, Coach, just a little bit ago, Tristan Thompson was saying that the championship still goes to the Cavs. He was saying what? just that, and he got clowned by his peers. Even young Ben Simmons had something to say about it. Different teams, different players on social media said, so, chill, buddy, make your, your vacation so, uh, plans early. I, I, I asked this. What should he say? 
that we're going to be terrible as a basketball team. He has to, say, to that. say that. I, I think it's motivation for everybody in Cleveland now to try and be respectable without LeBron James. Surely he's the king, best player in the league for the last, what, eight years or so. But you have to have that kind of a mentality that you're still going to be okay as a team with LeBron leaving. Derek, how long do you allow the shadow of LeBron to loom over a Cavs franchise? He's already in, the, he's already in L.A. Right. making movies, excited about with the Lakers. How long will they even allow that to be a part of the conversation? Well, you try to sweep it under the rug as quickly as you can. But come on, LeBron James <laughs> is the king. You don't just forget that. Teron Luce said it in his presser that we know what LeBron brought to the table for this team, but he's no longer here. So it depends on the kind of start they get off to, in my opinion. If they get off to a good start, it, it's easier to forget a guy like LeBron. I think management and ownership showed everyone in Cleveland that we want to win. We're not going to this right, not rebuilding. Re rebuild mode right away. They signed Kevin Love. They kept Thompson there, kept JR there, brought in a couple pieces around them, brought Fry back again, mm -hmm. saying, we're going to win our share of games this year. We want to be a playoff team. We want to give the fans who have supported us over these past four years something to still cheer about. seasons with LeBron James. The Cavs went to four straight NBA finals and he led them to a championship in 2016. But get this, the previous four without LeBron didn't go as well. 97 and 215, which would be the worst in the NBA for that span. And so guys, now without LeBron, again, I'm wondering over, under, do the Cavs get 30 and a half wins this season? <laughs> Mike? <laughs> well, I'm going to say <laughs> that, that I, am, <laughs> I was shocked when I saw the number come out of Vegas that they're going to win 30 or 31 right, games. Right. To me, with the depth they have, the veteran guys that have been to NBA Finals, they are definitely an over team. And I mean over by more than just one game. The East isn't the same. And I'm going to echo those same sentiments because I think losing a guy like the King will simply bring this team together a little bit more. And they're going to lay it out there every mm -hmm. single night. Cleveland is going to come to play. Over so under, I'm though? Go, I'm going to go over, a whole lot over. Okay. Yeah. Do they make playoffs? I think yes. Six, seven, eight, somewhere in there. Okay. And when you look at the Eastern Conference, you look at Atlanta, Nets, a uh, young Chicago a lot team. Of bad teams. <laughs> There's some wins that they can build up there and a couple of bad teams in the West that they will play this year.